I really do not want to be at this rental property. But I get out of my car, I step into the cold, and I take a look at this brick one-story house that I've come to inspect with my friend. You see, the reason I'm at this house is that the tenant's not paying on time, and this whole rental experience has become a big hassle for my friend, who's a retired college professor, who has many strengths, but property management is not one of them. So I'm considering whether to manage the property for him, but I want to take a look at the property and understand what's going on before I get into it. So we knock on the door and the tenant who is expecting us lets us in. And as I step inside, I begin to get worried. The first thing we noticed was stuff and trash everywhere. There were toys and clothes and papers strewn throughout the house. There was trash bags stacked up that had obviously been there for weeks. And there was food all over the kitchen countertops. And everywhere you went, it smelled horrible. But as bad as all that was, it only got more interesting. The first thing that tipped me off to a bigger problem was in the living room, there was four bird cages, of course, filled with birds. And as I looked at my friend's face, I could tell this wasn't in the lease. This wasn't something he's discussed with the tenant. And I could tell by looking at the tenant that he was trying to keep us from going to a certain part of the house. As we had walked around the bedrooms, he stood right in front of one particular door and wouldn't let us through that door. This door happened to be to the basement so of course, what do we want to do? We want to see the basement. So I opened this mysterious basement door, and as I stood at the top of the stairs and looked down into the dark basement, the only thing I could see were two little red beady eyes on a white mouse staring back at me. So I walked halfway down the stairs, and I started hearing a little squeaky wheel, like a rat wheel, going over and over and over again. And as I got to the bottom of the stairs, I realized it wasn't just one squeaky wheel, it was hundreds of squeaky wheels, and they were all coming from a room right in front of me with a padlock on the door. And then it finally dawned on me what was happening at this house. As I panned to the left and looked at the big open part of the basement, I realized that those hundreds of mice in that room were there to feed the animals that were there in the big part of the room. There were big snakes, there were small snakes, which ate these mice. But then beyond the snakes, there were iguanas, there were turtles, there were small turtles, there were large snapping turtles, and everything in between. The tenant of my friend was running an exotic pet store from his house. I actually don't remember a lot of the details of that visit from there, but I do remember thinking two things. Number one, I am not managing this property, at least the way it is right now. And number two, my friend's gonna have a difficult time getting this property back. And the second point was accurate. This was on a month to month lease, meaning there wasn't a long-term lease on the property. So he gave them notice that they needed to move and it took several months and I believe of not getting any or many payments from them. And he finally got the property back and he called me one day and said, Chad, do you wanna go take a look at the property again? As much out of curiosity as anything, I agreed to accompany my friend to the now vacant house. So we walked in and we walked past the kitchen, which still had trash bags stacked up. We walked into the living room, which no longer had any bird cages, and some of the trash had been cleaned up. And of course, we went directly to the hallway that had a doorway to the basement. And as I'm getting ready to open the basement door, my friend's kind of leaning against the wall in the hallway, and he makes the comment that, you know, this is not that bad. And at that very moment, out of one of the bedrooms runs the biggest rat-like mouse I had ever seen, not running away from us, running directly at us. And so, of course, I'm stumbling over my friend to get back into the living room. We both take about five minutes to catch our breath after running away from this mouse. And my friend, once he catches his breath, says, you know, I guess other than that, it's not so bad but I couldn't even respond to him because I was pointing my finger, looking at him, and on his collar was crawling the biggest roach I had ever seen getting ready to crawl into his shirt. And so I'm just pointing at this monster roach and he gra grabs the roach and slings it across the room. And once again, I can't remember any of the details from this story as I left the house and got back into my car. Now, in the end, I did not end up managing this rental property for my friend. But now, almost 15 years later, he or his family still own this rental property. They have a professional manager, and things have gotten much better since then. 
But the reason I'm telling you this story is that sometimes the most painful or humorous stories have the best lessons. So if you're someone who is either interested in getting into rental property investing or already has rental properties, I want to share a few quick lessons from this story. Perhaps the most obvious lesson is to not allow your tenants to run an exotic pet store inside of your rental property. Now, even if you are a pet lover or like reptiles, which I happen to like snakes, there are other reasons you shouldn't allow this. In our town, for example, there was an ordinance against running any kind of business in a residential area, but also in particular a pet business inside of a house. So we risked losing our rental license or getting other fines and penalties if we allowed that to go on or if my friend allowed that to go on. The other problem is that sometimes insurance policies have specific clauses about not, not allowing certain kinds of pets, which I haven't read mine lately, but I believe I know there are certain breeds of dogs they don't allow. There's also certain reptiles I think they probably wouldn't allow. And so you've got to read the fine print to find out whether that is allowed or not. If it's not allowed, you risk having a claim, like a fire claim or something else, where they could deny you if they found out that you were violating your insurance policy. But beyond those specific lessons, there's some broader lessons about being a rental property investor in general. And the first is about inspecting your property regularly. If you do have a rule in your lease that says you can't have pets, an exotic pet store inside your house, the only way you'll know that is by regularly inspecting that. Maybe every quarter, at least a couple times a year, going in and taking a look at your property. Sometimes you can just go change the filters on the heating and air, and that can be a good way to add value to your tenant, but also to get to take a look at the property. And either you or your property manager can do that. The second landlording lesson that I learned from this story and that I think my friend learned as well is that if you want to expect more from your tenants, you also have to expect more from your house itself. Now, in this case, there were no safety issues or structural problems that were going on with the house. Every year in our community, a rental property inspector comes out to take a look at the property. And in this case, the property had fire extinguishers. It had smoke detectors. The windows opened and closed. There were no safety issues with porches or walking into and out of the house. So those kind of things were taken care of. But with all that said, it was cosmetically very tired and it had a lot of room for improvement. So by putting your best foot forward, by taking some pride in the cosmetics of the property, and I'm not saying that you have to have a luxury property, but making it look as good as possible, you can attract a lot more tenants. Sometimes you can get a higher rent amount, but you can get the best tenants who want to come look at your property. I speculated that in this case, because all those things weren't done with the property, the tenant who was attracted to the property also had some issues. And my friend was willing to deal with those issues because they were willing to take this property. And that leads me to the third lesson from this story, which is about screening for the best tenants. If you have a quality product, a rental house or a rental property that's going to attract as many tenants as possible, then you should screen for the best ones who are going to pay on time and treat your property as well as possible. Now, screening for the best tenant is not the same as illegally discriminating. There are federal and local fair housing laws and just common decency that say you don't discriminate based on classes like race, religion, national origin, sex, familial status, like if someone has a kid or doesn't have a kid, or if someone has a disability or doesn't have a disability, these aren't what we're talking about. What we are talking about are what are the things financially and character-wise that show whether someone's going to pay you on time and treat your property well. So it is reasonable to look at someone's income and see how much they make, where they make their income from, what their job history is like. It is reasonable to check someone's credit to see their history of paying other people on time. And it's very reasonable to check someone's rental references and their past rental history, especially the one, not the one right before them, one like two or three before them, to see how they treated the property, how they paid on time, and to be very slow and deliberate about this process. And the frame of mind I really learned to take is that when you rent a property, it's like you're making a loan. If a bank makes a loan, they have a very slow application process where they deliberately look at all the details. And when you rent a house, you're essentially loaning that property to somebody for a certain period of time. So treat that as a very serious thing and screen them well. And if you do that, you're going to find that those tenants you get are going to be your biggest asset. They're going to be your friends. They're going to be people that you really like being around and you're treating them well. You're adding value to them and they do the same to you in return. 
If you'd like to see an example of what written tenant screening criteria look like, I'm gonna have a link both above me here and also in the video description below where you can get a free copy of my own tenant screening criteria. And the caveat there, of course, is that we all live in different states and have different rules. So you wanna use those just as an educational example and run those by your local attorney, your local property manager to make sure that's applicable to your area as well. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, please hit the like button to help me spread the word on YouTube. And be sure to hit the subscription button and the little bell so you don't miss anything. I have new podcast episodes that come out every Monday morning and new videos just like this that come out every Friday. My name is Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. And this is a channel all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. See you next time.